Welcome to Art 305, Art and Mass Culture, Chapter 4, Part 2b. Art and Individualism. The artist becomes a projector. The Napoleonic state lasted only until 1815. The French, exhausted by war and change, then restored a king to the throne. Though temporarily blocked in its political expression, the Enlightenment belief in individual freedom that had inspired the revolution remained a compelling social myth. Francisco de Goya, the artist becomes a projector. Many artists despaired for the possibility of individual freedom through politics. This reaction included disillusionment with David's use of art as a form of propaganda for the state. Such artists began to look increasingly inward for private visions to replace abandoned public expectations. The Spanish painter Francisco de Goya is one of the first to show this transformation of the artist into a projector of his own subjectivity. Early success as a court painter. Goya was a remarkably successful early in his career. Before he was 40, he was chief painter to the King of Spain. He led a life of unusually ostentatious independence at court, as evidenced by his highly unflattering portrait of the royal family and his risque portrait of the Duchess of Alba, his alleged mistress. So you can see from the start that Goya was less interested in satisfying the needs of his patron and more interested in his own artistic vision. Uh, from Los Caprichos. Goya did not experience the world as the bright sparkling surfaces of his royal portraits. The greed and hip hypocrisy of the Spanish court disillusioned him greatly. Goya used etching to explore his personal reaction to the social world. At the end of the 18th century, he did a print series called Los Caprichos. These cynical prints pointed out the foibles, weaknesses, or shortcomings in a person's personality that Goya saw around him at court. In order to sell the series and thereby make the images available to a larger audience, Goya took out an ad in the Madrid newspaper. The 3rd of May, 1808. The entry of Napoleon's army into Spain in 1808, however, overwhelmed even a nature as cynical and robust as Goya's. His painting, The 3rd of May, 1808, which he painted in 1815, shows the execution of civilians that continued, as the illuminating lanterns indicate, far into the night. The people of Madrid on the 2nd of May had resisted the French army's entry into the city. Uh, Goya's image of war in the 3rd of May can be contrasted with David's version in Napoleon Crossing the Alps. David painted war as the glorious actions of a transcendent hero. Goya focused on the suffering of anonymous victims. Stylistically, the two paintings differ as well. Where David continued the idealized, almost photographic realism favored by uh, Louis XIV and the French Royal Academy, Goya employed a looser, more painterly style that today we might say is more impressionistic. Goya, Disasters of War, the Napoleonic invasion of Spain, momentarily remembered in Goya's second and third of May paintings, lasted from 1808 to 1814. Throughout that time, Goya worked on another series of etchings, usually known as uh, Disastres de la Guerra, or the disasters of war, the full title of the series was Fatal Consequences of the Bloody War Against Bonaparte in Spain and Other Emphatic Caprices. A nightmarish inventory of the horrors of war, Goya exposes the shock and pain of man's inhumanity to man in a way not seen until 20th century photojournalistic coverage of the world wars. Disasters was not published until decades after Goya's death. They have the caustic bite of today's front page news photos from scenes of war and terror. In addition, Goya's etchings are among the earliest examples of the poor, pictured as victims instead of being romanticized as in picturesque scenarios. The Black Paintings. After Napoleon's invasion, Goya shut himself 
up increasingly in his villa. There, intensified by the burden of progressive deafness, his eyes turned inward. Inside himself, however, he saw only nightmares. Smeared in blackened colors on the villa's walls were images that Mark Goya's mind as one of the first to confront as a personal inner reality, the experience of nothingness, the experience of social reality as a lie. One of the largest paintings, black paintings, is Saturn eating his children. Saturn, or Kronos, was the original patriarch of the Greek gods. A fortune teller predicted that one of his children would depose him. In a vain attempt to change his fate, Saturn captured, killed, and ate all of his children except one, Zeus, whose mother hid him. Zeus grew up and, angered by his father's actions, deposed him, thus satisfying the fateful prediction. Was Goya saying the king was like Saturn, eating his children, the people? Was this also a powerful statement of mortality? Saturn, Kronos, was the god of time. Was Goya saying that time is devouring us all? Goya's black paintings are icons of the void. They present a sense of individual subjectivity where nothing is sacred or human to connect with outside the self. The black paintings may be where modern art begins. After Goya, art as self-expression became a standard, continuing throughout Van Gogh, the Surrealists, the Abstract Expressionists, and continuing into the present day. Goya's haunting subjective visions can be contrasted with the quiet clarity of Baroque images from Northern Europe. The Baroque in Northern Europe. Most of Northern Europe was not under the dominion of absolutist monarchs during the 17th and 18th centuries. Free of such autocratic control, capitalism developed, and with it a rising and increasing, increasingly wealthy middle class. The Dutch, for example, made their money with trade, including slave trade. But they did not want to portray the economic realities of their existence in art. Instead, the middle class of Holland wanted to decorate their homes with pleasant pictures of themselves, the places they enjoyed, and the things they liked to do which continued to be the pictorial preferences of the middle class. Outside the academy salon system, Northern European artists created paintings for sale in an open market system. Far from the academic hierarchy of subjects, which had placed monumental history compositions at the top of their ranked list, Northern European painters developed the arts of landscape, still life, and domestic interior scenes, also called genre scenes. Several of the practitioners of this more modest scale of painting employed an intriguing projective technology in their image making. The camera obscura, a mechanical eye for the artist. The use of the microscope was pioneered by the Dutch, who were the best lens makers in Europe. Their fascination with observing nature through lenses extended to art as well. By using the device known as the camera obscura, Dutch artists took one more step toward uniting Western art and technology. The camera obscura, translated dark room, is a device based on a method of producing a natural image that was known in Roman times. A small hole in a box acts as a kind of natural lens by producing an upside down image on the side of the box opposite the hole. Early camera obscuras were large enough to hold a human being. This kind has been used both for amusement and for the study of optics since the Renaissance. By the 16th century, a lens was substituted for the pinhole. The image produced in this kind of camera obscura was used as an aid for artists. The camera obscura available to Dutch artists of the 17th century not only had far better lenses, it also had mirrors inside the box that inverted the image to right side up so that the viewer could see the subject in a viewfinder on the top of the box. This was like a modern photographic camera in every major respect except that it did not use film. It performed two important tasks for the artist. First, it reduced the size of the image to a convenient scale. Second, it framed the two-dimensional image on, a, on the glass viewing plate, making it easy for the artist to study or trace the image for his or her own artistic purposes. And here you can see the camera obscura, 
with the artist using the mirror and then tracing um, the picture that they see through the lens. Johannes Vermeer, painting through the world, painting the world seen through the lens. A high degree of perfection and artistry in using the camera obscura as an aid in making perspective images is seen in the works of one of the greatest artists of the time, Johannes Vermeer. The innumerable artists use the camera obscura to enhance their perception and or to record their images for painting. Vermeer's work shows the most complete involvement with it as part of the artistic process. His paintings fuse the objective perspective of the lens with the creative perspective of the human eye. And here you can see his large landscape painting, View of Delft. A close examination of the View of Delft shows the unmistakable trace of the camera obscura lens. Sprinkled around the surface of this small painting are numerous pearl-like dots. These are the so-called circles of confusion, little unfocused beads of light produced by the imperfectly ground lenses of Vermeer's day. They are not an aspect of normal vision. The interesting thing about these circles of confusion in Vermeer's painting is that there are more of them than would be caused by the lens itself. Vermeer, in other words, not only painted an effect that is not part of normal human vision, he liked it so much that he chose to manipulate it in his paintings as an extension of his personal perception. Vermeer's involvement with the camera obscura shows how sight itself was coming under increasing human control. And again, here's the view of Delft. The camera obscura, the impending mechanization of art suggested by the use of the camera obscura in 17th century art was not an isolated or accidental development. It paralleled the broad impact of technology in all areas of Western culture. A decisive phase of acceleration began in the 18th century. By the middle of the 18th century, camera obscuras were considered standard tools of the artist's trade.